My name is Bert Chi. I'm a professor of electronic and computer engineering at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. I'm also the director of the Center for Aging Science there, uh, where we bring together faculty uh, from all across the university to address issues in aging uh, from the social, uh, economic, uh, scientific, medical, and technical perspectives. My own personal research is in the area of video-based measurements of human behavior, like facial expression and gestures, and how can we use these to build better human machine and human robot interactions by understanding better the intent and underlying state of the humans the robots are interacting with. Yeah, my name is Pascal Fung. I'm the chair professor of uh, electronic and computer engineering. I'm also the director for Center for AR Research at uh, our university. And this is a center that promotes multidisciplinary research. In particular, we're talking about today, which is uh, AI and robotics for health and smart aging, so we collaborate. And my own research area since 30 years has been in the area of conversational AI and speech and language processing, which also includes using speech and textual signals to analyze and detect uh, physiological uh, measurements in, uh, in people. And uh, Bert and I have been collaborating since 1997. We've worked uh, a lot on many different kind of projects in the area of human computer and human robot interactions. And today, we're going to introduce to you three projects that we're currently working on for Smile Aging. Yeah, I very much remember that first paper that we worked on on speech recognition way back in the late 1990s. And so that was really the spark of a great collaboration between the two of us. And what we'd like to talk about today uh, is really an area of intersection uh, between our two centers, one on AI uh, and then one on aging science. And the problem we're addressing is really that we have an aging society. I think this has been well publicized. And of course, on balance, this is a great thing. It's reflective of the fact that we're living longer, we have longer lifespans, uh, and it's also increasing the uh, pool of knowledge, expertise, and wisdom we have in our society. But of course, we all recognize that there are also challenges uh, that come along with this. Uh, and those challenges are driving us toward a vision of more uh, integrated, more seamless, and better quality healthcare for the elderly. And this is going to have a lot of different benefits. For example, number one, we're going to have uh, better um, monitoring uh, and support for the elderly uh, in the community. Number two, we're going to have more and more information where we can use to generate insights into the elderly that can generate better health care uh, and faster health care. Number three, we also have to think about the systemic effects and how can we alleviate the workload demands on our health care workers. And number four, uh, how can we take all of these disparate systems and integrate them together to provide a seamless uh, state of care that will, will, will go across the health span trajectory of the patients uh, by passing information successfully from one uh, system to another. What are the kinds of research problems that we're looking at, and what are the technologies that might be involved in that? Yes, indeed. Um, at uh, the Center for AI Research, we actually work together um, across departments and schools with our roboticists, our computer scientists, our life scientists, and uh, even our social scientists to uh, look for solutions for the aging society. So we cover application areas from home care, community care, to hospital care. And we use AI for um, things such as precision medicine, smart diet, uh, conversational AI for virtual companionship, for even um, speech and uh, gaze and computer vision to uh, detect a negative emotion in the elderly or signs of dementia. And we use robotics for um, um, as navigating uh, for mobility assistance. And we also use AI, uh, hopefully, in some kind of um, uh, consultation and diagnosis scenario. So there are a lot of areas that we're covering. And for, the, for me, this is actually personal. Because six months ago, my mother, who's in her 80s, had a stroke. And uh, by some fortunate coincidence, I arrived at her place to have dinner with her within half an hour when she had a stroke. And we called the emergency service, and they uh, rushed her to the emergency ward. 
my mother lives alone because she's very independent. And she insists that she doesn't need to be taken care of all the time. She doesn't want to have another human being in her house all the time. And one month prior to this incident, we actually had a conversation about this because I want to hire a full-time helper for her and she insists, no, she doesn't need it. However, she said she wouldn't mind having a robot at home uh, 24 by seven. And I was surprised, and why, mom? And she said, because a robot is like a microwave, a rice cooker, a refrigerator. She doesn't need to take care of the robot and she doesn't feel that her privacy would be uh, violated. So when she had that stroke, I was thinking, um, what if you know, um, there's nobody there uh, within you know, the three hour uh, golden window to save a stroke patient and a heart attack patient, right? Wouldn't it be nice if we have a robot who can monitor these elderly people living alone? Maybe someday it's gonna be me in 20 years. So in any case, we then, um, so rushed her uh, to the hospital. And this led to our idea of building a robot at home for the elderly, like my mother. Yeah, I remember that, uh, that experience that you had, and I, I can't uh, believe how incredibly lucky uh, both of you were to, for that timing to occur. But how, what if it was possible if we could actually you know, remove those you know, serendipity? Uh, and I think that uh, that would not only, uh, you know, Help, help provide better care for your mother, but also uh, relieve a lot of your uh, concerns as well. Exactly. So this is my mother. Uh, she recovered from her stroke in the ward. And uh, so we got a very generous donation by uh, a, a very generous person, and we started this project called Care E. It's a home care robot. I'm sure you have heard about uh, home care robots for many, many years now and none of which is really exceedingly successful. And the reason is that um, we actually do not need all kinds of fancy robotic functions. What we need is the robot that can administer medicine daily, bring the water to my mother, and uh, the robot that can monitor uh, 24 by seven, whether there's any sign of, uh, whether there's a fall, you know, uh, or whether there's any sign of um, um, distress. So by using a computer vision, gaze detection, or even initiating a conversation with the elderly person so that the robot can detect whether something's wrong from the speech. A stroke patient has slurry speech. That's the first sign I, I saw, um, I detected when I called my mother. So, and also such a robot can assist my mother to go to from bedroom to bathroom sometimes, right? Using autonomous driving techniques, but within the home environment. And this robot would also have this kind of, um, you know, infrared detection, motion detection. And last but not the least, my area, it will have a conversational AI system where it will uh, be able to initiate uh, conversations with my mother to keep her entertained sometimes, but also at the same time to detect whether there's any sign of dementia and so on. And this system can also establish a uh, communication channel between my mother and me, if necessary, or a communication channel between my mother and the caregivers remotely. And that would indeed relieve a lot of my stress. So um, many aspects of this uh, uh, is enabled by AI robotics, and we are working actively on this. Um, but I also noticed that when I sent my mother to the, when she was rushed to the emergency ward, the nurses came over and uh, asked her many questions to see whether she was having signs of you know, stroke or dementia or anything. And I saw this nurse going around asking all the patients the same questions. Some of them are conscious and some of them not. And then the neuro, neuro um, uh, doctor we were seeing was calling remotely. So there was a clear uh, need for more uh, help, more assistance to help patients like my mother, even in the hospital. So Bert, do you think we can do something to help um, the nurses and the doctors? I think you've really identified an important problem. Uh, we have to recognize that these demands on the healthcare workers are expanding. Uh, in fact, a recent survey said that uh, doctors and nurses felt that they were spending too much time uh, on administrative tasks. Uh, in fact, another survey followed up and actually measured this and found that 44%, only 40% of 44% of the healthcare workers' time was actually spent uh, working directly with patients. And I'm sure that these kinds of administrative things are very important for ensuring the quality of care, but they probably weren't the original motivation uh, for people to get into the field. 
And in fact, the World Health Organization has identified motivation as one of the key ways that we can bolster uh, the quality of our healthcare uh, system. And so the question we asked ourselves was, is it possible for AI and robotics to kind of help uh, manage this, uh, this, uh, this workload for the, uh, for the healthcare workers? And so we, in order to address this problem, we actually uh, assembled a tripartite team of not only uh, researchers within HKUST, not only from engineering, but also social science, uh, but also a private company within Hong Kong developing humanoid robots like the one that you see uh, over here, uh, as well, of course, the context providers, the hospital. And so we arranged these discussions where we are important to recognize a common understanding about what the needs are, because what the hospitals can provide is what are the actual needs. What a company can provide are what the actual capabilities are available in the market, and what the discussions can do is identify the gap between these two. Now, once we're here at the university working on the AI technologies, we can try to work together to close uh, that gap. And this is really what we've done through these discussions. And so we've identified two use case scenarios for the robot. One is the one that you see here, uh, who's interacting with a nurse playing the part of a, of a patient here. Uh, and that's uh, an interview called the abbreviated mental test, uh, designed to explicitly uh, assess for things like confusion uh, that Pascal talked about before. And this has to be delivered to every patient. Uh, but what you can imagine is that this robot that we've developed can deliver these tests and identify those patients who are most in need or perhaps uh, most uh, at risk of being confused and identify those privately, of course, to the nurses who can then pay more attention to those patients than allowing them to pay actual attention to this patient rather than going around and actually administering this test over and over. The other thing we've identified is uh, patrol tasks because, um, as you may know, at the nighttime, the wards are very loosely staffed. Uh, but at the same time, the patients are still there, uh, and we need to know whether they're getting out of bed or at risk of falls. And so we're going to have the robot here uh, patrol around the hospital in order to uh, detect these kinds of dangerous situations. You might ask, well, isn't it possible to put uh, cameras in the room to address this problem? But the issue is that what we need to do is prevent things that are happening. So if we detect, it's not enough. We need to actually intervene. And so you can imagine the robot coming over to the patient and using all the cues available to her, the same human cues that we have, to say, wait, a, th a nurse is coming. Please wait here, and someone will come and help you very soon. But I think the hospital is just one issue because uh, Healthcare doesn't end at the hospital. And so once uh, your mother went home, I know that she had to have a lot of follow-up things. And is there a way that AI and robotics can help in this case as well? Yeah, indeed. So uh, when, my mother, my, when my mother was discharged from the um, stroke war, she, was, she went home. And luckily, you know, she recovered quite fast. But she had to be followed up by community workers, speech therapists, and a physiotherapist. So she sees them, and sometimes a community worker will come, but it's once in a you know, few weeks because they also told me that they just don't have enough people to, uh, to help with, uh, with these patients at home. So um, then we thought of this solution that we've been building, which is a virtual assistant, virtual health assistant, uh, which is a conversational AI system you see here. Her name is Nora. So she will have a conversation with the elderly person and have a daily conversation. And then there's a, a from the speech and the facial expressions and case detection, uh, she will detect the mental state of the elderly. And uh, she will monitor over days or, or weeks, uh, depending on what the doctor would like to, to see. And so the healthcare worker can set up the system and then can collect this data when they visit her next. And this system we also uh, piloted during the pandemic at one of the quarantine hotels in Hong Kong uh, for people who had to go through 14 days of, to 21 days of quarantine. I was one of those people. So uh, I got to talk to her every day to tell her how I'm doing. And if there's any dangerous uh, distress signals from uh, anybody, then the system will alert um, the front desk or the uh, uh, emergency uh, and, and so on. In fact, the system will also lead the person who's using the system to do daily exercises and daily meditation and yoga and so on. 
So this virtual assistant is a dream come true for me since I've been working on conversational AI since the late 1990s. And uh, this is really the first time I feel like our technology can really help people, especially in this case, my own mother. Now, however, I mean, you probably know about ChatGPT and other kind of chatbots today. And this is really the time of the new generation of uh, conversational AI technology. And there's, a whole, however, a lot of challenge laying ahead for us. For example, these kind of uh, generative AI systems, they are very good at conversing in an open manner. Okay, you can talk about anything you want, it will give you some kind of very human-like response. However, today we cannot use them to build systems like this for elderly people or patients because today's generative kind of AI systems are still not controllable in the sense that they might generate answers that are simple hallucinations, meaning non-factual information and inappropriate answers. So the research goes on, and it is very challenging for us today, is focused on making the systems not just more empathetic, but also, even more importantly, safer and with factual knowledge. And there will be a panel later on, we'll talk about these challenges. So there's a lot of uh, challenge going on. And then we are really into, you know, since we've been collaborating all these decades, we are entering into a new era of AI and robotics for smart aging. And uh, Bert, there must be other kind of challenges in smart, uh, in smart aging or aging science. Yeah, I think as I mentioned before, uh, aging is certainly uh, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, but I think what our projects have really demonstrated here is it's multi-situational. And what do I mean by that? It's situated uh, in different contexts. Those include physical contexts, um, oh, sorry, physical contexts, uh, social contexts, um, economic contexts, and as well as temporal context. And so physical context, what I mean is, of course, the home and the hospital. And what we see there is that we've used different types of forms of robots. So they're not all the humanoid robots, but sometimes they achieve different forms. So how do we match the physical form of the robot to the needs and to the environment? Temporal context, what we've talked about is three different projects addressing three discrete points in the healthcare trajectory. But like I said, what we really need to do is take these ones and integrate them together so there's a systemic knowledge within the system that allows the patient to hand off from one to the other seamlessly to provide for better care. When we talk about social context, we need to remember that it's not just the patient-robot interaction that we've kind of talked about here, but it's actually how that integrates into a team, a team that consists of doctors, nurses, family members, friends, and all of these working around the patient, and how can we integrate robots into these teams? And the final thing is, of course, economic. Right, right now, these robots, especially the humanoid ones that we talked about, are quite expensive. How can we lower those costs uh, to provide the benefits to a wider range of people? So for uh, developers of AI technology and robotics technology, we actually need your help. We need the uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration. We need the feedback from uh, the experts, medical experts, health experts. We need the feedback from people who have elderly patients at home, like me. And uh, we need the feedback of social scientists. And we need to work together, together collaboratively to build the next generation of AI and robotics for smart aging, for smart aging and then for our future society. So thank you for coming to listen to our vision for smart aging using AI and robotics. And now we can take your questions. Thank you. Yeah, right here, and then back there. You spoke about the cost of humanoid robots and, and getting that down. So can you give a sense of what those numbers look like and, and what do we think those numbers look like in, in three to five years when, they, when we think that will become more realistic from an implementation perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I think right now the ones that we're, we're working with now are probably on the order, I don't want to say too much, but on the order of hundreds of thousands of US dollars. And so I... Yeah, and so I think that uh, I think that the uh, issue will really be in identifying those areas uh, where we really have a killer case study, right? That will drive uh, wider adoption. And of course, once that happens, then the prices will come down. Yeah. So I think we demonstrated their multi-path to robotic assistance, right? We show 
you know, humanoid robots, but also the very minimalistic functional robots, right? Robots on wheels uh, that can help my mother at home. Doesn't need to be a humanoid. And then we also showcase the virtual robots, like a virtual assistant that has a you know, um, computer interface. So I think we are, you know, have many paths to success, and that, that is really the future, I think. Yeah, uh, back here. Uh, you, I think uh, right here. Um, my question is, um, what techniques are the university exploring to mitigate these non-factual hallucinations? Well, thank you for the question. That is one of my core research areas. I think I've been speaking about uh, making AI more responsible and safer. Um, since I came here in the, you know, 2015, I think I was challenged by audience here that, you know, the kind of AI you're building um, how can it be really beneficial to humans? So what we are doing in the universities, we're doing a lot of core research on the algorithms. For example, how to mitigate hallucination in the training stage, in the database stage, and in the inference stage. So when the system is responding, how it can respond with, uh, with self-reflection and self-constraint. So today, we, all these generative AI systems have kind of a safety layer that's built on top of it. You probably heard about OpenAI's uh, uh, reinforcement learning with human in the loop, which is to uh, basically add a human, uh, human in the loop to um, have some kind of filter. And, uh, and, and uh, ChatGPT and these systems will refuse to answer medical questions, for example. So that's, but that's kind of a patching you know, um, you know, safeguard. It's a guardrail, which is necessary, but not sufficient. So universities, as research institutions, we're working on making the core algorithm more controllable and more aligned with our safety requirements and human values. Yeah. Go ahead, Noya. You. Thank you. Uh, my, my question is, as you develop these, these robots with all the experts that you mentioned, um, at one level, you're developing something that can be used across the globe, but at, the, at another level, how do you make sure that you're contextualizing within the cultural ecosystem to make it more you know, uh, 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 attractive to the user? Uh, and this is not just about having a sociologist on board. How do you uh, incorporate the local context and local culture? Yeah, actually, that was very important, especially for the hospital context that we were talking about, because like a lot of the uh, prior implementations of the robot that we're using were actually in English, and so one of the key things was, uh, can we get Cantonese uh, into the, which is the local language in Hong Kong, into the system? Uh, and I think that well, that's why we're working also with social scientists working in language to make sure that they're, we're getting the cadence right, the uh, so that the communication is really set up. Because I think when you talk about the uh, local culture, you and especially robotics, you're really talking about an interface uh, between the two of them and making sure we have that understanding. So that's why we need to pull in together these, mul these multidisciplinary aspects. Yeah, I think uh, I mentioned earlier, my mother said she's okay with a robot at home, and that kind of looks like a refrigerator, home appliance type of robot. So we're not putting a humanoid in her home because that will spook her out. So, but something that looks more friendly and more like a human appliance. I mean, in Asia, we already have robots delivering food in all the restaurants, so it's a very common sight already. So culturally, contextually speaking, um, it is very feasible to, to build this kind of robots in the Greater China area. Another reason is that the homes in Hong Kong, as well as in Greater China, tend to be on the, uh, apartments. Right? Uh, they tend to be, um, there's no staircase that the robot needs to go up to, and so on. So we take all that into consideration, and we try to build a you know, minimalist, uh, we take a minimalist approach to building this kind of home care robot. In the back there, you, you had a question? You had a question? Oh, no. Okay. Uh, this gentleman in front? Uh, did you have a okay, sure. Um, one of, hello. Good, good morning. Uh, one of the recent emerging te technologies that is going to be discussed here is also um, the, the development of medical technology that is flexible neuro, uh, neuroelectronics or sensors. Have you, been, have you been able to do any testing with um, any senior citizens by wearing the neurotechnology and then connecting the data to your, your robots so that they might actually be able to... Um, respond according to the analytics that they get from the direct 
brain uh, neuro data. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, so far within our, our projects, we're really looking at more conventional kind of communication uh, bandwidth. So we're looking at uh, things like uh, behavior, where, where are they looking, what is the eye gaze trajectory, uh, verbal behavior, and things like that. But I think you're exactly right. Once you have a, a robot, then you have to le leverage, well, how can you leverage the strengths of the robot and the strengths of the human? Of course, if you only use the humanoid uh, interactions, then the robot will probably always be at a disadvantage, uh, well, depending on what your beliefs are on, our, on, on the singularity. But then once you have other things, you know, the, the other robot can have access to other modalities, and I think you're exactly right. This is one area where we can really expand the capabilities, so that's a great point. Yeah. I think maybe this kind of a brain-computer interface you see more in a doctor's office or in a hospital setting rather than at home right, in the future. Uh, yeah. Hi, thank you for your incredible presentation. Um, I'm really interested in how uh, the metaverse, convergence of AI, metaverse, and blockchain can help with mental health, the crisis that we're experiencing globally. I'm wondering how your digital avatar or your digital robot, have you considered the mental health applications for, for people, young people especially? Actually, we were asked by one of the groups in the WHO to uh, test this uh, with young people. It was during the pandemic. This is why we actually converted the avatar into helping with people in quarantine. So there was a lot of uh, loneliness. You know, people got isol were isolating at home. So uh, they thought this kind of uh, um, virtual companion would help, uh, not just to uh, monitor uh, people's mental health, but also provide some kind of communication. But luckily, I think the pandemic is over, isn't it? And uh, I really dread to think that if we're gonna see that kind of situation again. Um, but if that happens again, now we know what we need, or how we can you know, uh, pre uh, you know, preemptively prevent uh, a mental health crisis by connecting people. So I don't know, think that robots will replace human companionship. So as I said, in our robotic project, um, one main function, one critical function is for the robot to initiate contact or communication channel between my mother and me. So my mother has an iPad, has iPhone, everything, but she still doesn't know how to use it to call me. She just memorizes my mobile number. She just dialed the number still. So the robot has to be proactively talking to her and say, you know, you want to talk to your daughter now and initiate that kind of call, right? So um, I think uh, this is helpful, but it's not going to replace human communication and human companionship. Yeah, one project that I want to mention that we didn't mention here uh, is actually a collaboration between myself, a life scientist, and actually a Japanese uh, landscape designer because uh, one of the things that have uh, been shown is that actually connection with the natural world is very important. Uh, and so we actually worked uh, with uh, the life scientists and the natural designers to actually build a Japanese garden uh, within our campus, uh, bringing people there and actually studying their responses through some of the technologies like eye gaze responses and seeing how those eye gaze responses uh, are correlated with the relaxation responses uh, because when you people are sitting, even you're sitting at an environment uh, and looking at it, you're not passive. You're actually engaging through the way that you look and, and how you look. And we found that that was actually correlated with the relaxation response. And we're looking to see whether those things are actually replicated in VR as well. Yeah. Any other okay. questions or comments? Thank you all for yeah, thank you your all attention. For coming to this session. And we uh, really enjoyed the interaction with you. Yeah, thank you.